Picture this, a team of Python developers, each armed with their coding superpowers, working together to create a magnificent software masterpiece. But here's the catch. Their code is a chaotic jumble, a tangled web of confusion that even a seasoned detective couldn't decipher. In this video, we unravel the secrets of writing effective Python code as a team, revealing the standards and practices that transform a group of individuals into a coding dream team. Get ready to crack the code and unleash your team's true potential. A lot of what I'm going to talk about in this video is my own opinion, but everything I say is based on experiences of working in and leading Python teams. You don't have to take all these things at face value and definitely don't just blindly copy what I show you here and force it on your team. Take time to talk to them and come up with your own set of practices and guidelines. With that said, let's start with some guidelines. A huge part of keeping any engineering team running effectively is making sure everyone's code is readable and easy to understand. Lots of teams have discussion after discussion about how code should be formatted. Should we use tabs or spaces, single or double quotes? My recommendation here would be to forget this argument altogether and use an auto formatter, ideally one with minimal configuration options for people to argue about, like black. People will still have different programming styles though, so it's useful to set expectations. Depending on the work you're doing, there may be many ways of accomplishing the same thing. For example, you could use a combination of Python's map and filter functions, or you could just create a list comprehension, which is probably more readable. At the end of the day though, it doesn't really matter what you choose, as long as you try to keep to the guidelines and ensure anyone joining the team is made familiar with them as quickly as possible. Onboarding someone into a large code base is difficult, especially if it's not an architecture or programming paradigm they've worked with before. One thing that can really help with that is documentation, both within the code and without. When you're writing functions or classes, make sure that longer or more complex functions have doc strings and that any tricksy bits of code have comments. Make sure your team agrees on a doc string style to use as well. I personally prefer NumPy doc over other common styles, but feel free to choose another if you like being wrong. Commenting just to explain what each line is doing is too much. Save your words for explaining the decisions you've made or why there's some magic number in the code. Keeping external documentation up to date is a whole job in and of itself, so lean on tooling to make it easier. I personally love using mkdocs material for my docs, and I typically enhance that with the mkdocstrings plugin to automatically generate documentation pages from my source code. It saves a ton of time. Following on from documentation, we have type hints. Now, not everyone likes using type hints, but honestly, they make working on a large code base significantly easier. Type hints not only help your code editor warn you when you're potentially doing something unintended, but they also show you the original author's intention for a particular function or variable. For example, if you had a function that takes in a parameter called date, it's reasonable to assume that you should be using a datetime.date object when you call it. However, the original author might have created the function expecting a string to display to the user, so something would break if you do pass in a date object. While it's true that the parameter could probably be more clearly named, I would rather have this first function with the string type hint than the latter with the date string parameter. Of course, a good doc string will also help here, explaining how the date should be formatted. And for God's sake, write tests. Testing can be a pain in the ass and often takes just as long as writing the code itself, if not longer, but they can really save you in the long run. Unit tests are a good place to start as they can be written alongside your code, but I wouldn't bother unit testing simple functions. Prioritize functions that perform key tasks and spend time making sure you cover edge cases. If you're not sure if all possible edge cases are covered, pick up a fuzzy testing library like Hypothesis to automatically test thousands of different possible input parameters. You can learn more about Hypothesis in this video here, and while you're at it, why not subscribe and click the bell to stay up to date on future content? If you're working with other teams in your company to produce larger software products, integration tests are a must. These should test the API that you've agreed on with the other team and ensure your code works together with theirs. You're effectively looking to test how well external systems work with your own, so you can quickly catch errors if something along that boundary changes. In my opinion though, the most useful tests are end-to-end -end tests. These typically come later in the development lifecycle and are more expensive to run, but boy are they useful. Test key user flows in your app, especially where code is a little more complex or a little more likely to break. If you're running a web app, use a library like Playwright or Selenium for browser testing. Or if your product is a REST API, test common user flows like authenticating then refreshing a token, calling multiple endpoints in sequence, or running batch flows against your API. You could do this quite easily in something like PyTest, especially if you work in a mono repo. Whatever you do, make sure these tests run automatically and you aren't just reliant on your team running them locally. Which 
brings us on to my final topic, automated quality assurance. This is typically what you run in CI and usually includes, but is not limited to, running tests, linting your code, checking code is properly formatted and testing builds. Almost every software company will have CI checks in place, but it's worth spending some time making sure they run quickly and effectively. There's nothing worse than having to wait 40 minutes for your tests to run just so you can make sure that your program works on multiple platforms. Try to parallelize and use faster tools. Learn your CI system inside out and figure out the best ways of doing what you need it to do. Here are some of the individual tools I recommend, like Black for formatting, Rough for linting, Pyrite for type checking. If you're running in a mono repo, you might also want to look into a build system like Pants. This can cache CI runs and ensure that checks aren't run against code that hasn't changed, which can save tons of time. Fast tools also mean you can run them locally, ideally in a pre-commit hook, so bad code doesn't even make it into your Git repo. Hopefully you'll now have some ideas for how to improve your team's development workflow and 10x your productivity. Did I miss anything important? Let me know in the comments. If you're a manager, bring these ideas up to your engineers and get feedback from as many people as possible before enforcing new standards from on high. If you're not a manager, manage upwards. Bring these ideas to your boss, making sure to get buy-in from other team members if you think it's going to be a tough sell. And if you want more evidence that you should be using an auto formatter on your code, you should probably watch this video here.